They were like other peoples, like other nations. Their ruler, their king, had led them to freedom through the wilderness, miraculously providing them food and water and their, their clothing over those long years of travel never wore out. Every bit of their needs, everything, was taken care of. He gave them laws, just laws, which taught as much as they governed and pointed out for them exactly the way to live so they could do so in harmony within their own community and with all those that they encountered, and most importantly, with him. He put able leaders over them, ones who would hear and obey his commands. But the people looked around and realized how different they were from their neighbors. Never mind all that their king had done for them. Never mind the justness of his ordinances. Never mind all the good things they had received when they obeyed him. They looked at the danger around them. And instead of trusting their king, they wanted one who was like the other kings that they saw. A military who would vanquish their foes, lead them successfully in battle. But wait, wait! He had done all those things through the leaders that he had appointed over them. Somehow, it wasn't good enough. They, they just wanted to fit in, be like everyone else. But that was not who they were called to be. Long before God had told Abram that his descendants would be a great people who would be a blessing to the whole world. Yet, God their King did not reject them even though they rejected him. He comforts Samuel who had faithfully served him all the years and charges Samuel to give a solemn warning of what an earthly king would mean to them. Something that they should have known by watching their neighbors as they had been doing. Drafts of workers and soldiers, oppression, loss of property, forced labor, taxes. Hmm. In some ways, government hasn't changed all that much, has it? Hmm. The people were warned, and they chose not God's ways, but the ways of their neighbors. Now, I won't tell you that all the kings were corrupt and evil. They weren't. But they were human, with human frailties and human failures. And those who were bad were very bad. We can now fast forward to the Gospel lesson from Mark. A word of explanation. Mark often uses what scholars call inclusio. That's where you have stories or accounts within each other. 
And here we have an example. Jesus' family comes, either because they've heard reports of others or their own witness, and they've come to restrain him, to restrain Jesus. But before that part of the story takes place, they're coming. We have the account of the scribes who are coming from Jerusalem to try to figure out where Jesus got his power. Let's remember what he's already done. He's healed. He's taught. He's cast out demons. Clearly, something extraordinary is happening, but what? It's clearly beyond human understanding. It's clearly beyond human authority and ability. So far, so good. But then, they come up with an explanation that to us sounds impossible. Their conclusion, Jesus is possessed. Say what? Today, we scoff at such an idea. We are believers after all. But how in the world did they come up with such an idea? These were men who studied scriptures in the greatest detail. Not only did they study individually, but they robustly debated the points to gain a deeper understanding. If anyone should have known the signs of the coming Messiah, it was they. How could they have not seen that Jesus had been sent by God, his Father? How? Could they think he was sent by Satan? And what may make it even worse is Jesus' own family doesn't seem to see who he was. Friends, these are hard texts to hear. It might be easy to condemn the religious leaders as corrupt or evil. Perhaps they were, but at the very least, they were being willfully blind to what they were seeing. In our words, they were seeing Jesus' actions as dividing and conquering. And we know that phrase. If a kingdom or a house is divided, it can't stand. It's going to collapse. We know it. It's common sense. And they knew it too. Jesus points out the truth. If they're saying that he is from Yezebel because he's casting out demons, they're not being logical. Because this means that Satan would be destroyed himself. His actions will be and are overcoming evil. Dividing it can't possibly strengthen it. And they were seeing God's activities as something evil, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. And then, too, we need to consider Jesus' family. What were they thinking? Why were they acting that way? And I'll, I'll give you four possibilities, and they're not the only four. They were fearful for Jesus. They wanted to protect him from the powerful authorities that were coming from Jerusalem. Maybe they thought he had gone off the deep end, and so they wanted to protect him from himself. 
work. They are afraid for themselves. After all, those men who came from Jerusalem were powerful. Would they come after them, his family? Or were they afraid for their own reputations? What would others think of them if Jesus was doing such things? And they too missed who Jesus was, the Son of God, fulfilling God's mission in the world. But then we have to take a stop right here. What is this unforgivable sin? It's calling God evil. And this is often a worry for some Christians because they're afraid that somehow, inadvertently, or maybe before they became Christians, they had committed a sin, and so they couldn't be saved, instead they were damned. Friends, we have all called on the name of the Lord, trusting in Him and His love. Remember John 3.16? The unforgivable sin is a willful Denying of God's goodness, of God's love, of denying God's action and activity in the world, in calling God evil. It is not a case of honest doubt and honest seeking for clarity. It's a closed mind that absolutely, positively refuses to be open. As Christians, we proclaim the kingship of our Lord and Savior Jesus. But like the Israelites that we heard about in our first reading, we often depend on our government rather than God. Some might point out correctly that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. But we are living in a liminal place, a place of already and not yet, a place where Jesus came and Jesus will come again. We are called to minister to our neighbors and not turn them away. Equally important is we are called to listen for the stirring of the Spirit from those within our ministries, from within ourselves. It's easy to overlook those without power or authority. It was true in Jesus' day. Those disciples that Jesus had pointed to as his family, the outcasts, the lepers, the formerly demon-possessed, the poor, women, those whose society said had little worth. Today, we might say it's the young, the uneducated, the poor, the unemployed. As we go out into our world, we must look for those who are easy to overlook, who we might not even see unless we take an extra bit of effort. They are children of God, precious in God's sight. We have a foretaste of the new heaven and the new earth as we gather at the table, hungry for God's reign to cleanse us, to cleanse our world. Our call is to follow our Lord and Savior, 
minister in his name. We're called to proclaim joyfully our Lord and Savior and to work for his kingdom in large and in small ways, to follow him all of our lives, even when the world doubts and disparages his goodness. Amen and amen.